Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the polls. We are coming to you live from our studios here in Accra. We're on the Digital Terrestrial TV because we are free to air. You can catch us on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144. This is Joy News, independent, fearless and credible journalism. Coming up this afternoon on the polls, government walks the talk as it engages uh, the judiciary as part of moves to secure a coordinated mechanism to protecting journalists across the country. We we'll hear from Information Minister Kujo Pongkrumah, who is asking for stiffer punishment for persons who attack journalists. The strongest message to the next batch of state and non-state actors who may even contemplate attacking a media practitioner in the line of his work, that it is not acceptable, and more importantly, the courts will severely punish you if you dare. More reaction to this. Meanwhile, internal jostlings continue as candidates vying for the executive position of the Ghana Journalists Association vow to tackle Ghana's drop in press freedom. This afternoon on the polls, we hear from some of the candidates who are already thronging in-house and asking for more support from journalists across the country and also more trouble for embattled member of parliament. Uh, for Dom Kwabinya Sarah Jasafu, as women's rights group pushes for a new gender minister to champion the affirmative action bill. She was around. I believe that a cabinet, she would be in a position to push it. So we are urging um, His Excellency the President to either ensure that she's in place to see to her responsibilities, including pushing for this bill. We'll hear from the minister right here uh, also on the polls. I am blessed to the polls as always. It's brought to you by Global Communities Digni Lu, Affordable Safe Sanitation. Remember that this afternoon we're streaming live on YouTube and all of our social media handles. It's at Join News on TV. Feel free to be a part of the show. Of course, with the hashtag the polls, my personal handle is at Blessed Sugan. Please stay for details. Also this afternoon, the Affirmative Action Bill Coalition is pushing for the replacement of the Gender Minister and Social Protection Minister as well. Sarah Jasafu doubles as Member of Parliament for Dom Kwabinya. The reason for this demand is on the backdrop of the failure in the passage of the Affirmative Action Bill uh, into law by Parliament. The bill actually seeks to increase women's representation in decision making when passed into law, but has been put on uh, the shelf for a very long time. Convener of the coalition, Sheila Menka uh, Promote, tells Joy News in an interview that it has become pressing for the bill to be passed immediately due to the rising cases of discrimination against women in the country. And I was a member of the technical committee that was put together as far as 2011 to work on the bill. We did a deck study and found out that a lot of groups, including the Women in Public Life project, which had been sponsored by DFID, had done extensive research all over the country in, among different sectors, and they came up with the conclusion that women are discriminated against when it comes to leadership positions. Apart from that, Professor Joji Chikata had also done some work with sponsorship, I think, from FES, which also confirmed that there's a lot of research out there which confirms this. Besides that, there are other international fora where they measure a country's, you know, gender when it comes to um, compliance. One is the Interparliamentary Union, okay, which measures where every country is um, periodically. And for a number of years now, Ghana is really down. When you go to, um, when you go to, if you check their, on their on their on their on their platform, you will find out that Ghana's number is not very well. And today we also heard from CDD, other indexes, all shows that when it comes to gender, we are really down. And, and, and there are also some obvious um, information out there. In our parliament now, we have, um, out of a parliament of 275, we have only 40 women. The previous one had about 30 something, so that was 13 point something percent. So from a little scanning, from existing literature and from the scanning of numbers. I, I have a table which shows you the numbers of cabinets and um, local governments. It shows you others and in, in all of them the numbers, women's numbers is down. Yes. You're worried about the SDG 5. Ghana has signed to it. 
it is projected that by 2030 should meet that target. How worried are you that as of now, the affirmative action bill has not been passed into law? Are we likely to lose out of that? We as um, an advocacy group, we are very worried because we think that it's very important that Ghana takes the steps to ensure that we comply with this very important instrument agreed on by the whole world, which is a Sustainable Development Goals, particularly Goal 5, which shows that by the year 2030, when it comes to key leadership positions, countries should have reached parity. From the way things are going, we are in 2022 now, um, using even cabinet as a, sorry, using um, parliament as a measure, we are at 14.45. A lot will have to be done, you know, to enable us to get to parity by the year 2030. The same with, I think, the, among the ministers, you know, cabinet ministers, they're supposed to be 19, according to the constitution. I think there are about five who are women, okay? If you look at the Council of State, the numbers is also the same. I think that the, the, we have a table which also looks at um, the chief directors, which is the highest administrative bodies within various government ministries at the executive level. The numbers are also more men. If you look at the judiciary at the highest, I think um, even from the Supreme Court all the way down, I think it is only in the Court of Appeal. I was at a, on a panel last week. It's only at the Court of Appeal where the numbers are almost the same. At the Supreme Court, the men outnumber the women. At the High Court as well. The numbers are slowly increasing, but we still haven't reached parity in several areas. And in most boards, state boards, there's usually the token one or two women, you know, as compared to the men on the board. So we still have a long way to catch up. The last one has to do with the Minister for Gender. We know that she will be a propelling factor to get this bill passed into law. She has, been, she has not been in office for a very long time. What are your demands? Well, as I said, this bill was signed by her. So it is a bill, you know, it's, it's a bill coming from the executive and it was signed by the Minister for Gender. So if she was around, I believe that her cabinet, she would be in a position to push it. So we are urging um, His Excellency the President to either ensure that she's in place to see to her responsibilities including pushing for this bill or if she's not going to be available an alternative person is made available to ensure that this bill among others is passed should the president president akufado get a new minister is that your demand your ultimate demand because you need to pass this law urgently i, I think that we are in june now i think the minister has been away for over a year so if there are challenges to get her back, I think that, yeah, I mean, personally, I think that if it is possible for her to be replaced so that we have a substantive person in place. Yes, we have a caretaker minister, but she has another ministry that she's fully responsible for. So making time for our um, ministry, I think she's also trying, but it may, it's not, it's, it may be difficult. So yes, if you have a, a substantive minister fully in place, it would really help to push a lot of things, including this particular important bill. Well, so be in place or be replaced, that's the call from the coalition. Uh, fortunately, we've been joined by the convener of the coalition, Sheila Menka Premo. Thank you for joining us here on The Pulse. But just before we start our conversation, um, luckily, we were able to have a conversation with the minister as to why she's not been in office for quite some time. I'd want you to listen to her justification and then we'll get your reactions to that. Karen Zina, um, with government, uh, the executive power and the parliamentary duty that I have. And at that time I had sent out things that I had to send out to the religious leaders in my constituency. And so that video definitely was for the constituents. And so I restricted myself to the people of Dominic Padena. And as the president of the Republic, he will wish the whole country. So that's the difference. And that's the reason why you, you didn't yeah, hear me mention. Right. Uh, but, but even the seats that you hold, the Dominic Padena <laughs> seat is under siege, as some are describing it. You're indicating to us that at least you've not been served. Uh, the committee may go ahead and pass whatever sanction it is that they intend to do. Are you not worried that you may lose the Dom Corbinia seat, particularly as the Speaker of Parliament, who even belongs to another political party, could simply go ahead and say you've breached the 15-day rule and then go ahead to declare your seat as vacant? 
I am not worried because I am very, very prayerful and I don't believe only in the physical. I also believe in the spiritual and I know my Lord knows exactly why I am not there and he's going to fight my battle. So um, as we say, and I've always said the battle is still the Lord's and the Lord is going to fight my battle. I'm not worried at all. Even in my third um, term election, nobody thought I would win because you know exactly the situation that I was in. Nobody thought I could win. Even my primaries, people thought I couldn't win. But God made me win. So God is the final say. Oh, so her justification on that, uh, it appears she needs to take care of some pressing family issues. That, that's been the official position ever since um, we, we heard from the minister. But for you, Sheila, uh, what's your take on all of this? Uh, what option should be the priority of the president at this moment? Uh, Sheila, I'm just asking about the position of the coalition. What should be the priority of the president at this moment? Replacing her or trying to get her in place to pass the affirmative action bill? Um, thank you very much. I mean, as far as we are concerned, we would like to see the bill passed. So, whichever way that we can get a, a minister in place to push the bill, we'll be fine with us. You know, whichever way that the excellence the president finds um, most convenient to ensure that that ministry is well catered for. And among others, the minister will then push to have this law in place. We'll be fine with us. It's that the president has put in sufficient measures. We, we have a caretaker minister um, who has been acting in that capacity for quite some time now. Why not target her, try and get her to do some magic at least, quote unquote, to, to get the affirmative action bill passed? Um, at, a, at a seminar today, we did indicate that we are in touch with the caretaker minister who has promised us to make this also a priority to, to push. So we are also pursuing that angle. Okay, We know that women generally have challenges, even women in leadership, they have challenges where they have to balance you know, responsibilities as mothers, as wives, etc. with other things. So we are not just saying that the minister, the the the, um, the 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 assistant president should replace her. We are saying that if she has challenges, then the other options should be looked at. And the current option in place is the caretaker minister, and we are in touch with her and lobbying her to try to push for this bill at the cabinet level. And she's quite receptive. And what has been your diagnosis of of the situation itself? The the reason for which we've not been able to get our members of parliament to pass this critical piece of legislation? First of all, the, the bill is not in parliament. The bill is still at the cabinet level, okay? Since we started working on the bill um, from 2011, it did go to um, parliament in October 2016. Um, this was just before the election in 2016, so they didn't get the chance to process it, and then it's... Um, that you know elapsed, so the whole process for looking at the uh, looking at the draft again and updating was continued from 2017 to date. So from 2017 to date, it hasn't got to Parliament yet. It's still at Cabinet level. Um, sometimes feedback comes to address some parts of it. We've worked um, with some of the ministers uh, over in that particular ministry to address it. So it still hasn't gone to Parliament yet. So what we are pushing is that cabinet should complete work on it and lay it in parliament as soon as possible. That is our focus. Basically, you know, since the draft of this bill started in 2011, we've had six different ministers for gender. Um, so that's in the period of 10 years, six different ministers, usually when they come and are appointed, they need to, you know, it's a very big ministry, yeah. women, children, and, and social protection. So they need to acclimatize themselves with all the issues on the different... Um, mandates that they have. And once they do realize that this affirmative action is one of the key things, they do pick up on it, but it takes a while. So for me, the, 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 the six over the period has been one of the reasons why possibly it has also 
sort of delayed. And looking at now, we are saying that it's something that should be made a priority. Mm-hmm. Primarily because, um, as you said, you know, one of the yardsticks that is being used to get this in place is the Sustainable Development Goals, particularly Goal 5, which talks about parity by the year 2030. And the way we are going, if we don't get the bill in place as soon as possible, it's not likely that we'll, we'll be able to, as far as this particular issue is concerned, we'll be able to um, reach that parity, particularly in all the three um, arms of government and also in, in the private sector as well. So and, we and I guess this is not, the not bill just about. Yeah, process. and I guess this is not just about the goals itself, uh, it, it, it's about the implication on freeing up the space and, and giving equal opportunity to women across the country. Uh, for, for many who see this as something which is uh, not feasible for us to achieve as a society or as a people, uh, what's your response to, to, to such persons and groups of, of people who believe that let's allow the system to stay at it, as it is? Yeah, yeah you're absolutely have correct. Representation in parliament for, by women. Um, um, it should stay as it is. We need to improve. We need to move on. We need inclusion for development. Sustainable development is all you're talking about. We need inclusion. The last population census that we ha- was held showed that majority of the people in this country are women. But when leadership roles, we see very few of them there. We need both voices, the voices of both men and women, to enable us to have sustainable development. So we think that this bill is sort of aimed at bringing gender equality, making sure that in all key areas, we have, I mean, as much as possible, you know, equal numbers of men and women to take decisions that would ensure um, the good development of this country. So for me, it's, it's a very good course that we are following and would we'll, ask all Ghanaians to join us in pushing for this. And what's more staggering is that um, at the press um, event today, you, you were also po- pointing out how many more women have become vulnerable uh, in, in this era as well. And, and partly that, that could be the reason why, I mean, we should be pushing for, for the bill. Give us a picture of, of why the essence and, and why to why it's become much more important to push through this bill, which will connect to dealing with some of those critical matters that you point to, the increasing attack on women across the country. As I indicated, it's, it's good to have an inclusive a government, you know, when it comes to leadership, we, have, we need inclusion so that we have both men and women at critical places to take decisions. At the press conference, we looked more at the, you know, the justification for this bill. We already talked about the Sustainable Development Goals. And our own constitution, Article 17 of the constitution, prohibits, um, have, I mean, you know, discrimination on the basis of gender. But it, it indicates clearly in Article 17.4 that where research shows that there is um, discrimination on the basis of gender when it comes to issues to do with economic and social and educational imbalance, then parliament can come up with such a law to right the wrong. And that's what we are pushing. You also look at other countries as well. Many other um, African countries seeing the importance of this have actually come up with legislation to um, ensure gender balance in several in, in, in their parliaments and several other places. Um, in addition, as I've indicated, I mean, sometimes people would ask you that, you know, there are some policies. Yes, we've had some policies like the 1998 um, directives on, on affirmative action. But the problem with policies is that a policy is not a law and can change. And sometimes it's difficult to, to, to challenge the lack of enforcement of a policy as compared to a law. So that's one of the reasons why we are pushing for this. Yes, there's been a lot of violence against women. Um, we have legislation in place that tries to address it. And most of these legislation were actually pushed by, by, by various women's groups. So when it comes to places where people who are facing violence can get services, if we have enough women there to address their needs, we believe that they will get better um, a response to the violence that they suffer.
Uh, we're grateful that you've been able to spend some time with us. That's the convener of the coalition, Sheila Minka Primo. Well, uh, our very own uh, MFR Powell was also at the event. Uh, she's been making uh, some contributions, talking about the need to empower more women and also touching on the role of the media in dealing with such martyrs as well. Well, uh, we'll bring all of that to you uh, subsequently, but for now, uh, it's a good time to also hear from her uh, on what her take is as far as uh, media, uh, the empowerment of women is concerned. The wheels of justice may grind slowly, but the feedback... Well, I'll bring that to you shortly. Now, Information Minister Kujo Ponkrumah uh, is calling for what he describes as some quick punitive ac action uh, targeted at perpetrators of uh, infringements against media practitioners. Now, according to the government appointee, it will be the strongest message to uh, the next batch of uh, state and non-state actors uh, that is, it is not acceptable to attack journalists, no matter how uh, much you disagree with what they say. Now, Ghana currently, as we speak, has dropped 30 places in the World Press Freedom Index ranking, prompting a response from the Information Ministry on the measures to be taken. Meanwhile, Information Minister Kojo Ponkrumah is asking the judiciary to punish with speed and severely uh, perpetrators of attacks against journalists. He was speaking at the opening ceremony or a training workshop for judges on the need to protect uh, the freedom and expression, as well as uh, to deal with matters of the safety of journalists. Yes, the wheels of justice may grind slowly, but the feedback I have from my media colleagues is that we believe some quick punitive action targeted at the perpetrators of infringements against media practitioners will be appreciated. It will be the strongest message to the next batch of state and non-state actors who may even contemplate attacking a media practitioner in the line of his work, that it is not acceptable, and more importantly, the courts will severely punish you if you dare. It will be a message stronger than any admonition that anybody can give. If we want these acts, which frankly are a disgrace and an embarrassment to our democracy to stop, please punish these acts with speed, regardless of who commits them. Well, so uh, let's uh, explore some of the matters. Uh, joining me now is Rashto Sasari Donko. He's uh, one of our colleagues here at uh, Multimedia. Obviously, uh, has been at the receiving end of all of this in terms of uh, media attacks and all of that. So, Rashto, I'm sure that you've been listening to the minister uh, make uh, a lot of points. Also now calling on the judiciary to try and pay, play some uh, roles in ensuring a coordinated safety mechanism for journalists across the country. Are you impressed about um, such a call anyway? I like the the tone of uh, the minister's uh, admonition. Uh, it sounds good to the ear, um, <clears throat> but uh, you ask yourself, um, what happened to uh, those who made certain infractions in that line um, previously? What has happened so far? Uh, it is just is it just words? or it is backed by action, a commitment uh, from the presidency down to uh, his ministers. In fact, in my case, for example, you have um, a whole chairman of uh, a committee that oversees uh, security in parliament uh, threatening my life and that of my family and asking people to beat me up. Until now, uh, he has not had the um, courage or you know the dignity to come out and say I'm sorry even after a committee set up by government itself exonerated me and in fact said that whatever I gave in front of the committee was true and indeed it did help unravel what happened in my line of duty at the draft he has not had uh, the respect for me to come up and say I'm sorry I got it wrong and 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 even the police as well to even as we filed a criminal case against him to even give us information as to whether he has indeed been invited nothing at all until now mm. and so uh, you look at other cases uh Ahmed Swale, for example uh, you know sluggish investigations nothing showing you look at my own colleague um who was beaten by the police until now you've not had any concrete step being taken against it 
no uh, release from government in that direction. Then right. you ask yourself whether this is just words, not backed by action. For, for you, why are we missing that link? Is it about trying to get the judiciary to understand the need to expedite uh, prosecution, or it's much more about the government commitment side, uh, which, which is also lacking? In fact, um, the judiciary is there. Uh, they uh, have a duty to discharge, but then it's just like um, going to a hospital and having a doctor prescribe medicine, and that is what the pharmacist will give you. Um, if cases have not been brought before the judiciary, uh, there will not be any adjudication in that direction for them to discharge their duty. It starts from somewhere. Are the necessary agencies interested in taking the right steps? In the case of Ahmed Suali, are the necessary agencies interested, uh, full of action, uh, to really pursue this to the latter, bring uh, concrete evidence, pursue the case uh, before uh, the judge will do their duty of examining uh, the evidence before them and taking action. Has the government itself, the president, shown um, any sort of um, uh, action to say that, yes, I'm coming up boldly to make a statement, just like the information minister has said, which, of course, is uh, pleasant to the ears. Can the president do so um, uh, publicly for people to take it more seriously? I think that, yes, his statement is welcoming, but we need more. We need uh, state actors, we need the president himself to come out and condemn some of these things. And uh, let's see some action uh, from state agencies in investigating some of these infractions and bringing uh, to bear justice. That will mean a lot towards the safety of journalists mm. as uh, we discharge our duty. Well, going exactly by what it is that the Minister of Information put out after the latest uh, press rankings, uh, it appears that they indicated very clearly that there was going to be a coordinated mechanism trying to robbing uh, some other state actors and agencies in dealing with the matters. For you, is this a walk of the talk that we've seen. You, you claim that it's just about the talk, but at least we're seeing some step here from the minister, isn't it? So um, I must say it's early days yet. Uh, he has come out to make a statement. I welcome that statement. Uh, it, like I said, it is pleasant to the ears. Uh, let's see in the coming days, weeks and months, uh, whether this will be backed by mm. action uh, on the part of state agencies, whether his office especially will push uh, that some of these cases be dealt with uh, so that we'll have more confidence in the fact that government is also pushing for the safety of journalists in discharging. Mm. And, and I'm duties. just w wondering if personally as a journalist um, anything has changed for you in terms of the atmosphere uh, as f after we, we saw the release of the press ranking uh, downgrading as part of some 30 uh, in index points. Um, would you say that something significant has changed in the atmosphere uh, and probably from, from how state actors collaborate and deal with the media ever since the report was released? Well, I, I think it sent a very strong signal out there that things are not really good. You know, uh, some of these rankings have uh, negative repercussions for the image of the country and uh, uh, the, the discharge of our duties abroad and all that. And so, yes, it sent a very strong signal out there that, hey, uh, it's time we sit up. And you find some uh, uh, people sitting up in such, certain areas, the reaction towards journalists, yes, uh, some uh, difference there. But I think that lessons can be learned from this. If um, this is not good for us, can the government come up more strongly, show commitment to uh, the safety of journalists? Can we go back, deal with cases that have happened, use it as a yardstick to serve a strong warning to people out there that allow the journalists to do their job? In fact, there are laws in this country if um, a journalist uh, has done something wrong, <laughs> there are uh, certain lines you need to uh, follow uh, to be able to have redress uh, to your case. And I think these are the things government needs to come up more strongly to back uh, some of these statements with mm. uh, a lot of action uh, so that we will be able to uh, see that yeah. indeed we're getting well, we're being We're being heavy on government. Uh, how about our own grouping, the GJA? Uh, one final opportunity is presenting itself again uh, through 
probably at this weekend, um, where we understand that, um, of course, we'll have the opportunity to vote for leadership of the Ghana Journalists Association. Many of them uh, we have seen, some who are promising to tackle this issue of the continuous attack on the press. Is that another way of trying to mount pressure and getting some results and creating a peaceful and safe atmosphere for journalists? If I, I have heard uh, some interesting um, things uh, in that direction uh, from some of the candidates. Um, uh, yesterday I heard uh, from Gihad Mensa, who spoke um, uh, to some journalists in Kumasi. He has fantastic ideas about what he wants to do in um, uh, pushing and advocating for safety right. of uh, journalists and all that. So I, I think it's one area that uh, candidates can also focus on. We need to hear more from the DJ, not just uh, the usual rhetoric, mm. uh, come up with press statements and then we leave it there. Uh, but how do we go ahead, advocate for safety uh, for journalists in this country? Arastos, thank you. Anyway, uh, let's see um, more and more of uh, what's going to happen over the weekend. Just a prelude because the internal justice uh, are continuing as candidates are vying for executive positions of the Ghana Journalists Association. Uh, they are equally making promises to tackle Ghana's drop in press uh, freedom rankings. Now, Dave Agbeno is one of the aspiring presidents of GJA. He's uh, been speaking to my colleagues uh, in the newsroom earlier today. It's been touted uh, as the solution, unionization. Uh, to the poor remuneration we are seeing in the media landscape. Is that something you hope to tackle or what's your take on it? And is that something that you want to pursue given the not? Unionization is, is being championed by the International Federation of Journalists. In fact, during my tenure as the general secretary of the GJA, the process began. GJA wrote to TUC that gave it a certificate but not a bargaining certificate. A certificate as a member of the TUC, but we were waiting for a bargaining certificate. That bargaining certificate will allow us to negotiate with media owners and get respectable or, um, how do I call it? Yes, respectable salaries for uh, its members. I know it will be difficult because already Journalists in various media houses belong to other unions. So if you need them to belong to the GJA union, you have to have a compelling reason why they should join the GJA union, which we have to work at. Because unions don't like losing their membership. So if you are coming up with a new one, you should be ready to fight and ensure that you get the membership that will be able to pursue the agenda of getting a good salary for your members. The truth is, I am personally tired. I've been campaigning for two years for this election. I was hoping that by Friday it will be over, that I can have some sleep. But it appears the problems keep coming. And it's concerning, but I am hopeful that between today and tomorrow, the issues surrounding the resignation will be resolved so that we can hold the election on Friday and then move on with our lives. Yeah, but our key question, at least for me, is um, attacks on journalists. Um, two of my colleagues, at least, one physically attacked, one verbally and threatened, his life threatened, actually. But in your submission, I heard you say that you're hoping that under your tenure, there will be a law you are going to push at least for a law uh, to deal with the attacks on journalists for instance the concern for us is we've seen previous administrations of the ghana journalists association and it appears that nothing much happens when it comes to attacks on journalists if a politician is attacked in this country you see that politicians rise and something is done about it. But we always leave it in the hands of the GJA to push for that to happen. So apart from the fact that ourselves as media house, we start a campaign against abuse on journalists amongst others, we don't really see the GJA backing us to do that. And it raises concerns for us. So most of us just sit back and then just watch. Let the GJA do what they have to do. That's why my senior colleague mentioned that it's time for a rival body. And most of us maybe may join that rival body because of some of these attacks on our colleagues. 
what really will be the assurance that under your administration it will be different? I'm not part of the executive of the GJA. I used to be, but I ceased to be a long time ago. Now, having been part of the leadership, I realize that GJA in itself is handicapped when it comes to defending the journalist under attack. It's limited because DJ do not have the coercive power of state to deal with the issues the way they want to deal with. They have to go through the police, they have to go through the courts. And if matters of that nature is before the court, there's very little you can do. But my position is that, why don't we work with parliament to enact laws that we can use by ourselves to deal with such situations? And before that is done, we need to put together a group of lawyers. Unfortunately for us, a lot more journalists are going into law. And we put them together to also deal with the issues to its logical conclusion. It is because we are unable to deal with the situation, or in such cases, we are unable to deal with them. That is why it continues. So for me, we need to put out the structures with the support of media organizations to be able to deal with such situations without saying that GJ is only interested in issue statements and the rest of it. Thank you. Well, let's take you to Parliament now. For first 10 members of Parliament of the new patriotic party are alleged to have received double salaries. The allegations were made by the pro-NDC think tank, ESEPA, uh, which provided correspondence between the controller and Accountant General's department and the members of parliament concerned. The SEPA accuses the MPs of failing to refund the alleged overpaid salaries to state coffers. And months after notifications by the controller and accountant general, the MPs in question are Sylvester Tete of Botiano English Yaman from who uh, is alleged to, to have pocketed some 131,000 Ghana cities. MP for uh, Pro West, Steven Jalula, who has allegedly pocketed 119,000 Ghana cities. And also uh, MP for Kintampo South, Alexander Jan, has been accused of uh, making away with some 119,000 Ghana cities as well. The last uh, legislator is the MP for Salagan North, Al Hassan Idi, who allegedly took. 42,000 Ghana cities. Well, uh, this evening, there's a challenge to that claim. So let's um, have an understanding to what's happening. Let's speak to one of the MPs uh, mentioned uh, by Asepa. Joining me now via Zoom is Steven Jalula, Member of Parliament for Pru West, also Deputy Minister for Roads and Highways. Thank you, sir, for joining us. So you have um, 119,000 Ghana cities in your pocket, I believe. You must be a rich man now, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you for having me on your platform. Um, I'm surprised that a research organization like ASEPA would do such a report without speaking to the key people involved um, and um, to also single out a few of the individuals involved and to publish our names leaves much to be desired. Um, let me just give you a brief of what happened. I think... Um, uh, we are six in number who transited from transition from DC positions to uh, members of parliament for our various constituencies. And um, we all know that after um, the 2020 elections, um, MMDCs were, were, were not paid for some time. Then when they started paying them, they mistakenly sent our salaries to our banks. We noticed that and together we came and demanded that it, it be stopped. And uh, eventually it was stopped in the August thereabout. And we met in September again as a group and we refunded every peswa of that money that was sent to our accounts because we are honorable members of parliament of the Republic of Ghana. And um, we, we have to leave by our designations as honorable people we have to be honest and uh, and truthful in all our dealings so that is why we voluntarily uh, returned our money personally on the 1st of october 2021 i wrote a check back to the government chest and the money was deposited
yeah uh, well Jalal, if you're still with us, um, would I want to, first of all, uh, I mean, check the claim that you're making that indeed the monies have been paid back. But there's a question about what proof you have as a member of parliament to show indeed that the, 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 the money itself has been sent back to the chest uh, of, of government. Well, we'll uh, try as much as possible to reconnect the lines. Uh, apparently, uh, we're having some challenges uh, hearing from... Um, the member of parliament there was uh, first of all denying the allegations and indicating that he does not have 119,000 Ghana cities with him as extra pay or double salary if you want to term it as such. Uh, he's been responding to some more claims and speaking on behalf of some four other NPP members of parliament who have been accused by the Alliance for Social Equity and Public Accountability of uh, making away uh, with some cash. We'll try as much as possible to rework the lines and bring that back. But well, in a rare show of uh, bipartisanship, uh, leadership of both uh, the majority and minority sides have lashed out at uh, ministers of state to refuse to appear before MPs to answer questions. Now, this morning, the Transports Minister, Kuku Furia Selma, was expected to answer nine questions but failed to show up. Last week, it was the Finance Minister, Ken Furiata, who failed to appear before the House. According to the Minority Chief Whip, Muntaka Mubarak, some ministers are taking Parliament for a joke and the House must act decisively against such ministers. Ministers are gradually turning this House, the Speaker, for lack of a better word, like a joke. Because, Mr. Speaker, they wait until the morning of asking the questions. Then now they will run to you that I cannot come because there's one agent or the other. No, Mr. Speaker, as you are very much aware, these questions are transmitted to the ministries long before even the business meeting happens on, on, on Thursday. And immediately after the business statement, it is written to them to remind them that so so and so date they are to appear. Mr. Speaker, if they wait until the day of the questions, then they do this. Mr. Speaker, as you rightly know, the number of questions that we have are standing are gradually getting out of hand. Mr. Speaker, for the Minister for Transport in particular, yes, he used to be one of those who happily come to the House and answer questions. But Mr. Speaker, of late, Time and time again, so I can recollect that this will be about the third time I alone is raising concern about his inability to appear before the House. The so Speaker will be grateful that you help this House hold these ministers accountable because this is one of the tools that is used in holding them accountable. So for the ministers to be picking and choosing when they want to come, Speaker, I believe as a House we need to resolve because unless the person is sick, you have deputy ministers, you don't even have the courtesy of sending if you're a deputy minister. But just right to say that you are not available. I don't think that is tenable. If we continue to allow that to stand, I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, this house will continue to be weak and weak. Mr. Speaker, so I will be grateful that you give some strong wording to the minister and get the minister to appear before the house soonest. Well, minority, uh, majority chief whip Frank Anor Dompre supported the submission of his minority colleague and called uh, for the naming and shaming of such ministers. We are ministers who, uh, who have been doing their work diligently and they take this as serious. I don't want to mention any names. Anytime a number of them are unable to attend upon the house, they've given notice ahead of time. And for me, that is the trust of your, your worry. The notice should come ahead of time. We understand that their man is a human institution, their money. But you cannot bring the, your, your correspondence or excuse duty on the same day that you're supposed to appear before this app. That is totally unacceptable. And it's something we shouldn't romance at all. And probably this will be the last. We will not entertain this kind of attitude and bring in the notice on the very day you're supposed to take your question. That will not be accepted, and I'm not too happy about it. So I'm in total agreement with the worries we expressed, uh, especially relative to the transport minister. And like you really said, he's one of the ministers who have been very diligent. But these days, uh, his attitude leaves a lot to be desired. So, uh, Speaker, I'm only going to plead that 
we will try and reprogram him for him to appear. And now the Attorney General, Godfrey Dami, says the Office of the Special Prosecutor is well-resourced uh, than his office. Now, according to him, less than 250 million Ghana cities, uh, as against 10 million cities for the OSP, has been released for the operations of the entire Ministry of Justice and Attorney General's Department. He describes the situation as unfortunate. He spoke at the swearing-in of the Board of the Office of the Special Prosecutor. The phenomenon of the creation of shell companies for the laundering and concealment of the proceeds of crime will be drastically reduced by the exercise of your powers under Act 959, just alluded to. I take note that the court is mandated to pay 30% of the amount realized from confiscation of property to your office. This undoubtedly can boost re revenue generation capacity of the office. I am fair in my conviction that the mechanisms set out in Act 959 can position the special prosecutor as a strong partner for the government in its fight against corruption and the promotion of good governance in the country. We all owe a duty to contribute to the success of this institution. At this stage, may I say that some malicious, ill-founded, and often ill-researched comments in the media about the office the resources at its disposal hardly serve the public interest. I was intrigued when one media house reported recently that only an amount of 10 million grants has been released so far this year for the Office of the Special Prosecutor. This the media house reported without regard to the general situation affecting budgetary allocations and releases for institutions investigating and prosecuting crime and the promotion of good governance in the country generally. The record will show, and the chief director is here, that apart from the amount released for compensation of employees, only a total amount of less than a quarter of what was reported as having been received by the OSP has been released for the patients of the entire Office of Attenjura and Ministry of Justice and the seven agencies under the ministry, including all the offices it runs in all the 16 regions of Ghana. This is unfortunate circumstance the ministry contends with, but we do not make a public spectacle of it because we understand the times in which we are. The media clearly owe a duty not to sensationalize report affecting the Office of Special Prosecutor in order not to create an unfortunate impression of a deliberate starvation of resources by the state, especially where it same is unjustified. The Office of Special Prosecutor needs and deserves the real support to the public and not constructive and defeatist criticism. There's a need for us to go back to Parliament and talk about uh, that report we brought to you earlier by the Alliance for Social and uh, Equity and Public Accountability, ASEPA, claiming that some four new patriotic uh, party members of Parliament received double salaries. Uh, Mohamed Jalula, the MP, is joining us uh, back to make uh, the point. Sorry, Honourable, uh, it appears that we lost um, the initial points that you're raising, but uh, obviously, from, from my understanding, you're basically telling us that you've returned the funds. But the question is, what's the proof to show that indeed such monies have been paid into the Treasury? Count that term. Um, we, we detected that um, salaries were still coming to our account even after we, we stopped being um, district chief executives and municipal chief executives after January 7, 2021. And this we brought to the attention of our contacts at the controller and counter general, indicating to them that uh, that must stop. And I eventually, when it stopped, we together, we are six in number, we came together and we refunded every peswa of the money that came into our account. And this was done in October of 2021. Thereafter, the controller realized that they had made a mistake and they wrote a letter to us um, December 2021, which is three months clear after uh, we had returned the money, money to the government's chair. So I'm surprised that SEPA did this story or this report without contacting the various um, individuals concerned. I don't know what they are seeking to, to gain from it. So I want Ghanaians to understand that we are honorable members and we do not seek to benefit from um, something that we didn't sweat for. And that's the reason why we took uh, the initiative to return the money to the government just without anyone even asking us to do so. 
Okay. Are, are you speaking? So are you speaking for yourself, or you're doing this I'm for all the for members? All of us. Uh, I mean, why speak for sense. why speak for all the MPs involved? Because why not play yes, safe by just we, by just speaking for six, yourself? We are six honourable members who uh, who were DCs and won our various elections to come to Parliament, and this decision was taken collectively to return the money three months before even controller got to know about the mistake they committed. And the controller is even officially yet to write to us to tell us that they have received the refunds that we sent to them in October. Meanwhile, we have cited internal memos that uh, shows that the head of the chief accountant had acknowledged receipt of my payment to back to the government's chest. But they are yet to do the honorable thing by officially writing to me that they received the refund that I sent to them. Yeah, but that's why it's safe to speak for yourself and not the others. Yes, I just want the world to know, the Ghanaian population to know that this affected this of us. Mm. Okay, but I'm even surprised that Asepa was single up, Stephen Janula and two, three others uh, right. to, 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 to report on, while mm. the liver they are the best. I'm not seeking to indict all of us, right. but the thing is that we have not done no wrong, we haven't done no wrong. And I think the Ghanaian people should rather be thankful that um, mm. we have refunded this money on our own. And I think there's a problem with the system, the payroll system. And somebody should have noticed that on the 7th of January 2021, um, somebody seems to be a member of the executive and now a member of the legislature. Anyway, Stephen Jalala, thank you for your time. Well, thanks for staying with us here on The Pulse. When we return, we'll bring you more details of that joint news exclusive with the former Minister for Energy, Poitier Jacko. Please stay with us. And you're welcome back to the polls now. Former Energy Minister Boche Jaco has described in a joint news exclusive interview, uh, has actually disclosed that he will be running for president. Now, the governing New Patriotic Party will soon commence the search for a successor to President Akufado, whose task will be to lead the party as its flag bearer in the 2024 elections. Even before that search begins, Boche Jaco says he will be the best bet for the New Patriotic Party in the next elections in 2024. The former government appointee was also uh, dismissing claims in that interview that has not in good terms with the president. It's been a while. You, you've been under the radar. Is, is that a fair well, description of what's happening? Keeping under the radar. What, what's been keeping you away, really? Um, minding my own business, uh, but doing a lot of things. Mm. Uh, a lot of family issues, a lot of traveling around, a lot of talking to party people, uh, involving myself in a lot of the party activities. So. I see that you're still passionate about the New Patriotic Party. That is my inheritance. The tradition is my inheritance. Um, <clears throat> my own father started politics in 1943 and graduated into the NLM, the UP, uh, and then had to go into exile and Ankoma for seven years. He came back, was in the Progress Party and the Popular Front Party, even though at that stage, age had caught up with him and therefore was not very active. Nonetheless, that was his tradition. And he leaves it to us as, his, as our inheritance. And if you are not passionate about your inheritance, you are the force that will destroy that inheritance. Mm. So yes, I'm passionate about that tradition, but for a purpose, to the service of my country. Mm. We'll talk about that service in detail, but first of all, I'm sure that you've been monitoring uh, the reorganization process of the new patriotic party mm -hmm. it started this year uh, a lot of ranko at the base when the reorganization process started uh, we've seen some changes in leadership at various fronts and 
we are now faced, uh, and I mean you as, as the new patriotic party, are now faced with the opportunity of electing your national leadership in yes. terms of the executives, uh, which is uh, happening um, in a few days mm -hmm. from For, uh, uh, next a, a month. Few, yeah, few weeks. Few weeks from now. It's fair to say that. What's your impression of the reorganization process itself? Well, this is a ritual we go through every four years. And as I wrote in the graphic a while back, it is a ritual that has always, it always has its rancor because of the competitiveness of it and because of the strategic imputations people make for their future political careers. So it is unfortunate but necessary part of, of the arrangement. I cannot claim to be happy when things like that happen. We've gone through it many times and we ought to, by this time, have nailed down the propositions and the processes much better. I hope it is advice to us that going forward we, will, we can do better and must do better. But here we are, we've gone through the polling station exercises, we've gone through the electoral area coordinator, we've gone through constituency, regional, and here we are national to elect the 17 men and women who will need, lead the national party. I pray and hope that decency, fair play, decorum would be the hallmark. Because you see, at the end of the day, the nation is watching us. The nation is watching whether we will leave, live up to our credo or whether we will fail in that matter. Whether we will live up to that credo and enhance our image as a national political party or whether we will fail and damage the corporate brand and image. That is the proposition before us and all of us must be cognizant of that and say that yeah we will stand up and be counted so that the future of this party will be bright because then we have become attractive to the majority of the nation. So what you're saying is the NPP is not as attractive as That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that we can be more than what we are. And all organisms must grow, must be better. When we started this party, we were not what, where, where we are now. But our conduct and our performance must keep on enhancing the image of the party. Anything that detracts from us and what we stand for, damage the corporate, corporate image. Oh, no, but I'll tell you about a trend that many within the, your party believe is dis, I mean, detracting you from that game and an ultimate goal that you have, which has got to do with, with the cracks and divisions along some lines of persons who are seeking to ultimately fill in the slot after the president is no longer taking mm -hmm. his turn mm -hmm. as the leader of the, the, the NPP, the flag bearer. And, and I'm sure that you've heard some of these reports that people are aligning on grounds of the Alan Baumia camp. Your name has also come up anyway. Are you first of all in the race, standing and, and making that firm decision that, well, I want to lead my political party? Absolutely. Going into the future? Absolutely. You're running for president? Yes. Zeal for service of my country and party. Zeal for service of my country and party. How determined are you to, to achieve that target? 
Absolutely. This is not a matter you trifle with. Right? It must at attract your full commitment. Right? Drink deep or touch not. So I'm not going to, to, to <laughs> trifle and play around and then say, well, no. I am committed to it and I will do the best I can as God makes me able to achieve it. Mm. And what you are in for will definitely open you up for some assessment in terms of what it is that you've done in the past in your service, uh, public service and other um, opportunities that you've served in or capacities that you've served in in the past. One of them that comes to light obviously would be your tenure as the Minister for Energy. Mm -hmm. Uh, you still insist that your integrity is intact regardless of the circumstances surrounding your resignation. Don't you feel that that could be I did I did but the thing is if the thing is to assess your your performance what po what politician or public servant hasn't been asked to leave a position how what is the impugning of integrity President said, this, I gave you the job, I want you to give my job back to me. End of story. Was it as simple as that? Yes. Has anybody accused me of stealing money? Have you heard anything like that? I'm asking. Well, that hasn't come up, but, but of course, we don't, we don't know the exact circumstances around well, if you your don't, decision. Well, if you don't and know, why, if you don't know, then... The opportunity is here to ask you. No, yeah. if you don't know, then let's do, not get hypothetical and speculative, right? He who alleges must prove. If you want, if you are inquisitive enough and want to find out, you ask the president, why did you sack him? They have other reasons right that i may or may not know so you ask the authoritative decision maker as to why he took a certain decision you have your, your own judgment about that situation my judgment you, my judgment my judgment is Im unimportant whether i agree or not that is his to, to, that decision is his to make, I, unfettered. I, I guess you, you may not be necessarily bothered about what's happening in terms of your decision to resign, but many argue that it will definitely come up. You have to work with the same class of people or group of people if indeed you want to succeed as the presidential candidate. Even if you get to win, these are the same elements that you'll be dealing with. For instance, it's been alleged that you're not in good terms with the president. Um, who, who alleges? When was the last time you spoke to the president? Do you have to speak to somebody or the fact that you're not speaking to somebody means you're on bad terms with the president? But this is supposed to be your good friend, someone you've worked with on a project to win political power. When was the last time you spoke to the president? Maybe a year ago. That clearly shows that something is not right. No, that doesn't mean anything. You see, that the... the, the to impugn hatred or something amiss because somebody hasn't spoken to somebody, I think it's ridiculous, right? My best friend in the world is called Godwin Boating. He lives in the US. We haven't spoken for two years. But deep down in our hearts, we know what bonds us. I haven't spoken to Gordon in two years. And when, if we should meet today, it will be like we've never missed a step. So that is trifle. Right? But working relationship is key, you agree. These are your former colleagues, these are persons you served with in government. At least you should maintain some cordial relations with them. Do you I, do, have I do have cordial relations with a lot of people in the party. Including the president? What is cordial relation? When we meet, we are very decent and civil with each other, right? Like most of my colleagues. Naturally, I'm a hermit, right? So if I haven't spoken to somebody 
You cannot impugn discord or hatred. I think you'll be dri driving the ball oh. too far. Oh. Yes, we are the political party. As Darocha used to say, you don't have to be friends to be in the same political party. You have to have the same common objective of service. Once you have that au fait, you are done. Right? We don't have to be friends. Okay. So let's talk about the objectives now. The NPP promised to deliver a number of things to the people of Ghana, having assessed your own political party over that period, be it four, six, moving into the eight-year term, your party says you're, you're likely to break the eight. I mean, that's the target that you're setting for yourselves. Looking at your performance now, if indeed you become the presidential candidate of the new patriotic party, how would you convince the people of Ghana that indeed the NPP deserves another term? On our record of achievement, all the way back from Kofu to now, I will dare say that our tradition and its ideology represents the best options for this country. We are the safest pair of hands to handle and manage the affairs of this country. And it's been proven time again. That does not mean that everything is honky-dory. That does not mean that we get everything right. Right? But any time the MPP is in power or has been in power, our fortunes have been brighter. It's not exactly the same today as we speak, isn't it? It is. Look, the difficulties the world and we are going through are part of the natural ups and downs that every human being or every country will and must go through. Yes, now things are difficult, and we admit that, and must admit that. But we must array ourselves in a formation that presents and fashions out a credible solution for our upliftment. To me, that is more important, right? Your assessment today may be very different from your assessment next year mm. as things begin to work through. So you believe it's more about external factors, largely? Look, Ghana is a small open economy. 80% of our GDP is impacted that way. We are not one of the big boys who can insulate ourselves against many of the things. That does not mean we should lay supine and be rolled over. But nearly willy let it be said that there are a lot of things out of our hands, out of our control, that we wish weren't so. Just a few days ago, the Feds increased their base rate by 0.75. You know what that means? It means that all capital is now going to look in terms of asset values mm. and move to the US. And when they are moving to the US, weak countries like ours will suffer the consequences of uh, uh, diminution mm. and also increases in, if we have to, pari passo increase in rates right. and also the currency depreciation. I'm glad that I'm having this conversation with you because that's your background. You have quite an extensive understanding of what's happening around the world even and even within our country. You've heard the argument, for instance, from the minority side. They've argued that it's about profiligacy within government, the, the fact that government is not being prudent with state resources. Of late, the minority has criticized government of pouring funds, which, which is in dire need for development and other stuff into, for instance, projects such as the National Cathedral. The president has also been taking on uh, for his expensive travels, for instance. These are some of the expenditure areas that minority believes 
we could work on in terms of tackling the challenges and plugging the loopholes? Do you think that they are justified in some of these demands? It's a narrow-minded view. Because you see, if I were to sit here with you and show you the macroeconometric model of the Ghanaian economy, the various and its in, the various variables and their interplay on how the the economy y variable behaves these the coefficients of the, the things they are talking about will be insignificant presidential travel doesn't matter it does in a sense particularly of the optics so the president travel is how much that it will derail a 66 billion dollar economy I'm not, I'm not saying those expenditures are not important, but let us focus on the big things, right, that, that turn this economy. For instance, I was very dismayed at the hula baloo over, over E-Levy. And I'm sitting there and I said, guys, are you, have you looked at your budget recently? We have a budget deficit close to 48 billion cities. And we are haggling to death over 7 billion. Now let's say that, okay, granted, we give you the 7 billion. You still have a deficit of 41 billion. What are you going to, we are now going to do a, 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 a Y levy and a Z levy to close the 40, 41. That's not the argument. That's not where the problem is. The problem is with the flawed architecture of our national budgets. How we be it that since 1961 to date, there has been only three or four years where we have had budget surpluses. Consistently, we are in deficit. Because we are playing games, smokes and mirrors. I'll take your solution to the Ghanaian economy shortly. Uh, but just before I do that, some have taken on the finance minister. They believe that it's, it's about prudent economic management as well, and that the economic management team, uh, we've heard the vice president mention the name, and obviously your name has come up at some point. Uh, it's no longer the case now, but you've heard about the names. The ultimate backstop to the finance minister, as many have argued. The minority is calling for his head. The fact that the president must dismiss him. Are you impressed with his work? That's, that's, their, that's their point of view. But are you impressed with the work of the economic man management team? Look, you've been part. I of have sat in economic management team meetings, and I've seen the enormity of the difficulties we face. Look, this country faces huge problems. Somehow, we've been able to opiate ourselves and minimize these problems. And even attempted to dismiss as if they were, they were minuscule and, and uh, not important. We have opiated ourselves to minimizing the problems that have faced this country for 30, 40 years. We better wake up, right? And see the, the, the development of this country as a joint collective effort requiring the, 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 the contribution of each and every one of us. Otherwise, if we place it on the heads of one person or two persons, we'll be joking. I guess that's coming up because we've heard the refrain, the NPP has the men. You've heard that? You've heard I have. That. You've heard that before? I have. And, and I, I, I will not shy away from it. Because I know the talent and the qualities in the MPP. I will not shy away from it. Whether all the talent are getting the opportunity to play the necessary roles is another matter. I sat with an MP yesterday for about four hours. And I was blown away. Depth of knowledge, capacity, his intensity, all of that.
And definitely you can be uh, on the lookout for that. We'll uh, share that full interview on all of our platforms for you to have a retake or rewatch. But it's time now for us to talk about men's school. Nearly three years ago, the Attorney General commenced the prosecution of uh, men's school CEO Nanapia Menta. He's accused of defrauding thousands of customers of uh, millions of cities through uh, his gold dealership firm. Now, not even a single witness has testified in the case, and there's been more than 20 court adjournments. In today's uh, edition of the Total Recall, uh, we told the story of how some customers are, of course, bearing the brunt of the men's gold crisis. Joseph Akable has more. <music> I nearly killed myself that day. I nearly killed myself. Even the day I went to men's school, I heard it on radio, but I could, I could say it's not true. So I, I myself went to their head office at Jolu. So as somebody told me the thing, that, hey, now we won't in now, baby. I just fell down and then my one, some of my friends put water on me before I, I, get, I get up. I nearly hung myself. I did it cry because they, my wife and the children came to show me that I was dead, tight and myself because that is my life. That is everything to me. I don't have anything. My family, there is nothing. So I'm the one that I struggle uh, to help the family. Very touching, yes, there. But that has been the situation of many customers uh, across the country. And in fact, the coalition of uh, grief customers of Men's Gold are once again mounting pressure calling on government to deal with the concerns. Fred Forson is of course convener of that uh, group. Fred, it's um, good to see you again. Uh, we keep talking about this, um, I mean we go way back, so many yes, years, yes. Uh, and it appears nothing is really coming out of this. Why not simply give up, go home, relax and pray to God that at least someday, sometime, you would of course work and, and gain your investments once more. I wish I wish that could be the case, but you know, um, it, it, it shouldn't work that way, mm -hmm. and we must not stop at uh, demanding for a locked-up investment, because we are all living in the society, and we know that this is a deliberate attempt to deny the customers of their rightful investment. There are people who have gone on retirement, those who are due for retirement. And they did this investment for the purposes of most of them for their retirement and for their future. And so it will be impossible for us to leave this and just allow the, 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 the thing to go like that. To be honest with you, we are demanding our money and we are not going to stop tomo today or tomorrow until the last person mm. invested in men's gold is paid. And in our view, we believe that it's government that must rise up to the occasion because from what is happening, the, the item that the you read, yeah, yes, and even from our brother, right. he's, he's, uh, he represents one of the many people who are suffering in mm. silence. Mm. Just this morning, I think when I came for in the, the morning, morning show, right. I heard that there is a customer who died just two days ago in Takradi. Even that one, it's not even part of the 179 people that we know. And so I don't think we should allow this men's good issue and say that, oh, number one, and whoever is behind him or the people who are supporting him should just go and chop the booty. No, that one will not happen. And as a country, the earlier we accept that it's a responsibility for the nation to ensure that the customers are settled, the better. Because as long as we have life, we will continue to pursue this money and we shall get it. Mm. But it appears that your group and your activities, for that matter, have gone under the radar for some time. Yes, because the strategy is that, you know, we approached Parliament and thankfully we sent a petition. There is now a motion, a private member's motion. It's even the more reason why we are calling the Attorney General or the government to rather work with this MP who has, laid the, who has uh, uh, filed the motion. Because we believe that even this petition that we sent to Parliament, or even this private member's motion, it should have been a government business, okay? Because the same strategy was used in the DKM issue in 2016. So government did not take the initiative. We have taken the initiative, and we want the government to adopt this motion 
Because if the government really want to see the citizens freed or the problem resolved, I'm sure government had a good intention in going to the court. I believe so. So if they have that good intention, we believe that parliament is the solution. Well, this is a problem that a similar one was solved in 2016 in the DKM matter. So why don't you adopt the motion in parliament, use it as a government business, because the uh, parliament will be able to help you to unravel the mystery surrounding this men's gold mm. issue. And there you can have a solution. Otherwise, otherwise, like most of, our, most of us are thinking, it appears there is a serious connivance with some people in government and men's gold, especially in Amwan. But, but the because only like way out... More but, than but, but, yeah, but I guess the only way out would be through government. You can't do this without government because uh, even if you go through the parliamentary processes, yeah. the finance minister has the, that ultimate power to say, well, I'm releasing the funds and make the payments available. If he says no, which government says it remains its stance on the matter, Let that me it's it. not going to Let expand, me we'll do, expand we'll, we'll public, public is, funds is, on this, we'll this then, then that will be the deadlock. Who, what else could parliament do about it? I'm, I'm just trying to think about it. In this democracy, the finance minister is our servant. Uh, our servant. Right. He only does the bidding of the people. And he has no other choice than to collaborate with parliament. Okay? He doesn't have the final weight. Not even the president. The president is our servant. We sent him there. Whatever he does, he does it on behalf of the people. So if the people representative agreed that this is what we think... Fred, should Fred, done. Fred, I'm sorry, but this is just men's goal. Men's goal is just men's goal. About 25% of the adult population are connected in one way or the other. Really? Yes. 25%. We have lawyers. We have Supreme Court judges. We have churches. There are some churches. One of the Saturday churches, they have 2 million Ghana cities in men's good. SDA, Church of Pentecost, Methodist, Car uh, uh, the Christian, uh, um, Catholic. Almost every church. So men's good is not like we the fianga, fianga, tingalinga people you see around you. There are big people behind us. I'm telling you. Who have made investments? Yes. So when you see a statement coming out there, don't think that if you see my handwriting under it, don't think that it is Fred and Isaac and Odati mm. who sat in the room to write to. Mm. We have big lawyers behind us. We have many people, doctors and people behind us, security experts, the army and the rest of them. I'm saying 25% of the adult population are involved. If you have uh, quite, quite a significant and yes. influential so population, it, 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 why, why then that, that should even make it easier for you to retrieve your funds. That is why we are saying that no matter what we we'll do, government must take responsibility. And thankfully for us, you, you were even f uh, quick enough to freeze the asset of men's good. So these assets are in your custody. The bank account of the gentleman is also in your custody. So what stops you from even, you know, you have even started the, you started the process of you went to court for what you call the preservation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you are, you are preserving this item for almost four years, and 179 plus one person is dead, and you are not doing anything. It appears we don't have a president. Are we going to see another form of pressure on the streets to mount pressure on the president, who you claim is not listening to your plea? I think, I think uh, 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 it appears the government, the president has neglected us, but I don't think he should continue to neglect us. He should come to our aid. We are pleased. Um, I remember in one of the releases, we call upon his prerogative of mercy to be touched. That this matter, because, blessed, let me tell you, this matter will not die until the last person is paid. And mm. when I say this, we know what we are talking about. Mm. Okay? We know what we are talking about. Look at the caliber of people who are involved in men's good. So there's no way this matter will die. In fact, for the attorney general but, to have asked the court mm -hmm. through Iyoko mm -hmm. that give me the right to go and sell the asset in January this year, it means that government is involved. Right now, we need even answers to what happened to the auctioning that they did. But, but I mean, you would want to be fair to government, at least that the trial is still going on. So accusing them of still being a part of this is quite challenging. Isn't what, it? what you read to us, what you told the whole world, you mm -hmm. know, 
this is a very broad station, right. a global platform. Right. He said over 20 adjournments. Even I'm sure this, if we update it with what happened. But adjournments are, are very normal in, in court's proceedings. Oh, no, this one, uh, Miss Norma. Okay. Well, this one is, <laughs> without prejudice. This, this one, the they are deliberate. No, yes. Yeah, we, need to, stay that. we, we need to say that th this is the position of the group. Because that's not our view here at Join News anyway. Yes, but, but yes, yes. You agree that it's quite normal to have, I mean, adjournment of cases. This is this is a normal. Not that type. I'm, I'm sure. I, I saw you saying that not even one person has testified. And me, you see, men's gold issue is not a murder case. These are investment that are locked up. So investigating this men's gold, I'm sure a first starter investigator should be by now mm. uh, more than 48 months down the line mm. should be able to come up with a, a watertight case and say that we are going to prosecute. And not even a single person has even been called. Mm. It should tell you. Right. It should tell you. And right. let me tell you. It should tell you that the Attorney General is playing Palongo in the court with the, with the case. How would you prefer the money disbursed? From government's coffers or allowing men's go to do the distribution once more? You see, that right now, eh, I keep on saying it. On the 12th of September 2018, the responsibility of paying the customers shifted from men go to the government. Because you shut down the company, you proceeded with a freezing of the asset. So it's government, sell the asset and tell us that, okay, the total cost involved in this matter is let's say 100 cities. When I sell the asset, uh, when I sell the asset, I will get let's say 40 cities. And then, then the 60 still... cities, we come to the table. And, and here's the bigger challenge. And, yeah. and here's the challenge I see with the approach that your yeah. group has been advocating for. Mm -hmm. We'll come to a point where government will then be faced with the challenge of trying to get the database of customers. It's of available. Men's we have our database. But that's your database, not, not for men's gold anyway. So you call men's gold because currently. And will men's, gold, data, be, will men's gold be willing have, to provide have, that data? We have sent a data to, the, uh, uh, to parliament. I'm sure in the process of looking at the investigation, Men go be invited to provide or come and confirm or disown data. Yeah, they could d disregard that anyway. If you right. disregard it, bring your data. If you don't bring it, then you go with what you have. And that's, that's, that. that's the point where potentially we could have criminality coming again. No. Because if I come to you and if I register as your member and you ask me how much, uh, of course, that, no, no, no. has to give back to me. That's not how we I could, I could put the figures out Let's there. It, right? I'm telling you. The data we have is credible. It's an honest data. But it's not from men's gold. It's not from men's gold. But it's from us, the customers. Yeah. So if they have different data, they should come and disprove it. I mean, I want us to get there. And, and that could make you multi-millionaires if, if we were to grant to that. Because someone could walk in and say, well, my dealings with men's gold amount to some 1.5 million Ghana cities. How are you going to disprove that, for instance? So you are telling me that... If I have a transaction with you and you give me a document mm. that proves that I have a transaction with you, in the event that you are no more there or I produce my document and it's authenticated, that this is authentic document, I still need you to, to come and confirm. Authentication so will be a challenge fail, for it. Authentication listen, will be a challenge for it. The, the, the one to authenticate so when you the transaction... The, listen the, to the word. Yeah, when right. you deliberately yeah. fail to come and confirm, mm. then I should be denied. The, the one to authenticate um, yes, the, the sir, transaction... Well, but, but the one to <laughs> authenticate the transaction here will be men's gold. It doesn't always work so. I remember when the, the banks were collapsed, they appointed a receiver. It's the receiver that authenticates those documents. You don't necessarily need... Kusindum or Comrade before to come and say that, yes, you worked in Unibank, so I gave you the document. There is a receiver. It's done professional. You appoint auditors. Okay? When auditors come to your firm, sometimes you don't even need to be there personally. Your books are there. They look into your books and authenticate whatever you have written. If they have any doubt, they go further to do further checks. Mm. So it doesn't, it doesn't require your presence or your word. Mm. The most important thing is that the books are there. And I'm sure they have several ways of assessing whatever documents a, a customer has. Well, would you wish that government, I mean, goes back, meets with the finance minister and begin the disbursement even without the criminal or civil prosecution, whatever it is? We have suggested that from the way things are going, we have suggested that government could uh, suspend or delay the criminal prosecution, okay, and look at the civil route. 
that's why we believe that parliamentary approach is very, very important and to help the government to do it. So, like, we believe what you just said, that sit down with the finance minister, if you like, bring one of the representatives of the leadership or their consultant or whatever into it. Let's look at it and resolve it. Because lives matter more than even the criminal prosecution. Because the criminal prosecution is not going to yield anything to us beneficially. Yet. Okay. We need to go. Do you know the whereabouts of number one anyway? Last, I th uh, uh, we just discovered there's a document, you know, during the 2019 uh, financial sector bailout. We discovered that there was some releases from parliament, about 15.6 billion cities. And out of that, they said 6.3 million was supposed to be used to settle those who have done risky investment. And we wonder how many good customers were not considered. Mm. And these are documents signed by the finance minister himself. Okay. Nothing so happened. you don't know where number one is? We don't know. What we know is that he comes to court protected by state security. And the victims are dying. As you said, you saw my brother visually impaired mm. and the rest of them. So it's, it's very sad. And we are asking the government, it's time to come to the aid of the men's good customers and help save life. Anyway, Fred Forsen there. Thank you. Now, some drivers are considering parking their vehicles, joining the public transport or walking. This is not because they are exercising. Uh, it's because uh, they can no longer afford the skyrocketing fuel prices that appear to have become a weekly affair. Mami S. Thompson has been speaking to some of these drivers in our Living Standard series. Because the fuel is high, so I'm doing a double work now. Any day, any time, the fuel price is going up. And right now, we don't know what to do now. So we have to start packing our cars and start working. Since the beginning of the year, Fuel prices have shot up from an average of 6 cities 80 pesos in January to 13.50 pesos in June. This is about 13.9% rise every month since the beginning of the year. Some drivers say it is now a luxury to fill their tank to the brim. Kojo Adami Yabwa, a hotelier, is next in line to refuel, he said in January 2021. 120 cities worth of fuel was enough for errands. But today, even 400 cities is not enough. He tells me he spends 1,600 cities on fuel every month, yet his salary has not increased. According to him, if the prices should go up again, he'll be compelled to pack his vehicle. Now it's our time for us. We have to start working. Because any day, any time, the fuel price is going up. And right now, we don't know what to do now. So we have to start packing our cars and start working. Where I stay, I buy 400 Ghana CD a week. 400 Ghana CD a week. It, it will not even fill the tank. It's half tank. 200 CD, I will buy it on Monday. Then somewhere Thursday, I have to buy another 200 Ghana CD. First, it wasn't like that. First, I'll fill my tank with 130 Ghana City, 134 Ghana City. But now, even to fill my tank, it will take me about 500 or something Ghana City to fill my tank, which is bad. Israel is a bolt driver. He tells me he acquired his vehicle when the fuel prices were a bit stable. But with fuel prices skyrocketing, he has to work double shifts to make more money. At first, it was good because it's someone's, I'm using someone's car. So when the person gave the car to me, he asked me to go and try it. If the fuel is good for me, then we go in an agreement for work and pay. So when I tried it, that was in January. Yeah, when I tried it, it was very good because the fuel was low. So I went in agreement with him and now, because the fuel is high, so I'm doing a double work now. I'm when getting you are doing double work, like how much? Over time. I'm doing over time now. Mm. So yeah. how much do you spend on fuel a week? Okay, I spend almost two fifty. And when I spend two fifty I get I don't get enough. Maybe when I get I'll get like one fifty. 
Kofi, a taxi driver, is visiting the fuel pump for the second time by 1 p.m. He bought 150 CDs to start work and luckily got a 100 CD sale. He is back at the fuel station to buy another 100 CD fuel. According to him, he is yet to make daily sales for his car owner. Petrol is expensive. All the money I make, I used to buy fuel. I have already filled 150 cities, but I'm back to fill 100 cities more. My car uses 6 gallons, but I cannot fill it to the brim. I hardly make sales for my car owner. There are no jobs. Otherwise, I would have parked the car. But it's for someone, so I have to make sales. Well, analysts say the unpredictable fuel situation will persist for some time due to disruptions of Russian oil supplies. Also, the executive director of the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, COPEC, Duncan Amwa, says if the situation should persist, some oil marketing companies will go out of business and that will mean higher unemployment figures. Many say high fuel prices have disrupted their month budgets and constricted them. There are calls on government to scrap petroleum taxes to cushion Ghanaians. But will government yield to the call? And that's all we have for you here on The Polls. My name is Blessed Sugan. Don't forget to log on to myjoyonline.com. We have updates on our stories there.